Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Grow Your Knowledge webinar series from SIBSI. This week our speaker is Carl Collins, Head of Digital Engineering at SIBSI. Over to you Carl. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello and uh, welcome to this Grow Your Knowledge uh, webinar. Uh, the topic today will be automation and productivity. Uh, just to let you know that this session will be recorded and you'll be sent a link to download the recording if you choose to do so. We will also be making a PDF version of the slide deck and that will be made available to you as well. If you have any questions, please use the question facility on your GoToWebinar uh, toolbar and we will answer as many of them as we possibly can at the end of this session. Okay. First things first, I'd like to talk about what automations are. There's a general conception that they look like the big glass screens in NCIS and things like that, where all of the graphs jump up and down and they show human beings what all of the information is. But there's a reality that automations are generally just things that computers do better than people do. People are very good at the artistic end of engineering, understanding what systems can work best and the ways in which to arrange those systems. To define those systems and actually come up with some uh, general equipment that you would be specifying, there's a lot of hard sums and hard physics and computers actually do a much better job at that and certainly a much quicker job than human beings. But to achieve that, we need to put in some fundamental work to program the computers if you like or use the software in ways in which we can automate those processes and that's what I mean by automations. So in short just de-stress your day all that hard sums and hard physics if you can build that into a template or build that into a workflow it allows you more time and space to do the artistry of engineering which hopefully will help to de-stress your day. Now I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of different automations. These are ones that uh, me and uh, some colleagues from the Society of Digital Engineering have developed over the years. This is only a small array of the things that you can do, but hopefully what we're going to show are some methods that you can use for these specific automations, but also to adopt and adapt them and make new automations of your own. So let's start off with mechanical, and here we're going to look at some concept load calculations, ventilation system velocity analysis, and expansion vessel sizing. So let's kick off with some concept load calculations. Now, in this instance, I'm going to be demonstrating using Revit, although the concepts here have been developed so that they can be used in other platforms if that's what you're using. I'm not going to show you a click this, click that. I'm going to assume that you have a basic knowledge of the platform that you want to be using. I'm going to be using space objects for this particular calculation, but you can use rooms or area plans. It depends entirely on what suits you and your workflow. And the architecture and values I'm using here are just for demonstration purposes. We're not actually doing a real live project. OK, so first of all, we need an architectural model because we can't do much engineering without a building. So we need to load the architectural model into our building services model. One thing that is commonly missed is when you load it in, make sure that the architectural model is room bounding. Otherwise, you won't be able to make any sort of area calculations and they are fundamental to what we're going to do here. Then we need to place the space objects. You can do that automatically using the function I've highlighted here. So that should just sprinkle all of the space objects wherever an architect has placed a room object. And hopefully this can save you an awful lot of time. So this is a plan view of the building we're going to use. And I've grouped together the spaces using space types. There's various different ways that you can group together the spaces. And again, it depends entirely on your workflow and what the building typology is. Here, I've just used the space types. The next thing we need to do is to create some parameters that will allow us to perform these calculations. And this is really fundamental to getting a lot of these automations up and working. And it needs a little bit of forethought. So let's add some parameters to the space category for our variables. Make sure the type of parameter is set correctly so that the units work. This is really, really important. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on. 
and also to use a naming scheme that makes sense and is readable so you understand what each parameter is and what it's intended to do. You can see the graphic on the left hand side with labelled available fields. For example, we've got space, mechanical, heat gain, lighting, load, density. And what I've tried to do there is say what this parameter is applied to, the discipline, what it's for, what that heat gain is in relation to, and the type of parameter it is. So saying load density, I'm saying that this is watts per square metre. Then we can create a small schedule. And this schedule here is applying the parameters that I want to work across each space type. So we can see here we've got the name and the level of the space types within our building. And we're adding in standard values for lighting load density, small power load density, infiltration and internal summer dry bulb temperature. For the lighting load density, you could use a space type parameter if that already exists within the space type. You'll notice that the columns here are coloured and I'm going to try and keep those colours consistent throughout this presentation. The colour shown here, if it's yellow, the value is coming directly from Revit. If it's green, that means I'm applying a parameter to a space object. If you see a blue column, that means it is a project parameter. And if you see an orange column, that means that parameter has been calculated within this schedule. So let's do a simple initial calculation. Here we can see that I have actually multiplied the area by a parameter for the small power load density. It's a very simple sum. I'm just multiplying one by the other. And we can do this for a large range of concept load calculations using rule of thumb data. And here in a separate schedule where I've listed out all of the spaces, we can see the yellow areas. We have the area values. We have our lighting load density and notice that they are consistent amongst the same space types. We have small power load density and we've multiplied the densities by the area to give us a lighting load and small power load. We can add those two together to give us a full internal cooling load for that space. And also at the bottom, we can summate them so we can look at our overall lighting load, our overall small power load and our total internal load. The advantage of this method is that as the building changes, for example, if we load in a new architectural model, these values will be automatically updated. Equally, if we change the load density values, the sums are automatically recalculated. Let's look at a slightly more complicated calculation. And we can see at the bottom here, we've got an awful lot of things multiplied together. But let's break this down so we understand it more simply as engineers. Here's our favourite old formula, Q equals MCP delta T. And we can break that down into parameters that we're using within our platform. So for the mass flow rates, that's just the infiltration volume times the air density. CP is the specific heat capacity of the air. And the delta T is the temperature of difference between the external summer dry bulb and the internal summer dry bulb. We can then create another schedule to demonstrate this. And we can see here, we now have the blue columns as well to demonstrate that these are project parameters. So the density of air remains consistent, the specific capacity of the air remains consistent, and the external summer dry bulb temperature remains consistent. And using some simple sums, we can work out the infiltration volume, and from that, the infiltration heat gain. And again, we can summate that at the bottom. And again, as with the previous schedule, as the architecture changes, this will automatically update itself. And this is perfectly adequate for an early concept design level cooling load. To do the full cooling load, we can actually create schedules for small power, lighting, occupancy sensible and latent gains, solar and fabric infiltration. We could combine together all of that into one single schedule, which will create the entire conceptual cooling load. We can do similar things for heating loads, ventilation loads, riser sizing, plant sizing, and anything else that can be calculated through the parameters that we've made available to ourselves and will be automatically updated as the building changes over time. 
Next, let's have a look at our ventilation system velocity analysis. And hopefully this will be probably the easiest of these automations to perform. Again, we're using the same piece of architecture and I've grouped them together in the same way as I did before. And I've added into it a very simple toilet extract system, as you can see there. We've also created a small color schedule to show what the velo calculated velocity is for the air within those ducts. And I've gone for light colors for lower and a bright orange for four meters per second or more, which is why I want to set my warning level. So if we zoom in, we can see that this is working. So we've got a nice light green and we have a velocity drop before the second branch comes in. And we can see that that has now calculated the velocity in that transition piece is low. Now, what if we take this diffuser in the bottom left hand corner and increase it from 25 litres per second to 50 litres per second? It has automatically recolored this piece of duct to show that the velocity is higher than we wanted. And this is a very simple guide for any engineer to see that as we change the values associated with our extract grills, that this is having a material effect on the ventilation system. And the bright orange says, hey, wait a minute, I think we might need to do something here. Either the flow rate is incorrect or the velocity is too high. And we can do this for any number of different parameters and different systems. So for example, we could do this with a water network, looking at the pressure drop or the velocity or both within different views. Now let's have a quick look at some expansion vessel sizing. We can see here on the right hand side of the image, the expansion vessel can be a quite significant part within a plant room. So it's important to make adequate space for it. To understand the space that's required, we need to work out how much expansion volume is going to be created within our systems. But water is a bit awkward because it doesn't expand in a linear way like most other materials. This is a graph um, from the empirical values of the expansion coefficient against an array of temperatures. And as we can see, that is not a straight line. Now, what I've done is I've actually mapped these values in Excel to give me that curve. I can then put a line of best fit or a trend line over that curve. Another of the functions of Excel is that you can actually apply a formula to that line of best fit. As we can see, this actually maps very, very closely and it's given us this formula up here that we can use later on. Here's a very simple heating system with flow and return. We don't need to do anything overly complicated here. This is just to demonstrate the point. Again, I can use a schedule and I can input into that the fluid type. Now, these are fluid values from SIBSI Guide C. So how do we do that? Well, in the PDF version of SIBSI Guide C, here are all the values that we would wish to use within our LTHW system, but they're not much use inside of a PDF. So what we need to do is to create a fluid type labeled appropriately, and this is now bringing in all of that data from the guide. Now, obviously this involves an amount of copying and pasting or retyping, but if we do this once and within our project template, then this will be available to us for all of our projects all of the time. So let's do this once, make sure we do it properly, and then we'll have this data available throughout all of our projects and we can do um, calculations such as this in all of those projects. Now, when we look at our pipe system type, and we can see here that this is our LTHW return system, we can say this is the fluid type that's going to be bringing in those values from our SIBSI Guide C table. We also need to demonstrate what the temperature is within the return system, and also what the mains water temperature is going to be, because it's the difference between the incoming fluid temperature and the operating fluid temperature that will give us our expansion. Then we can use our formula that we've got Excel to create for us. I wouldn't fancy trying to work that out on my own. And we can transpose this into a formula that Revit can understand. And that's what we're seeing here. We're having our 0 0.0004 from the formula and applying our parameters that we have available. And this is calculating our volumetric temperature expansion coefficient. 
we can then use that coefficient to multiply that by the volume and the delta t and that gives us our expansion volume for that part of the system so the flow at 80 degrees as this volumetric expansion coefficient gives that expansion volume the return system at a lower temperature gives this volume we can then look at the parameters within that table and for our expansion volume we can say let's calculate the totals then if we go back to our schedule we can see it's summated those parts and 75.7 litres is the expansion vessel volume for that system as it exists. As we extend our system to go throughout our building or as we modify it according to whatever design is required, this will constantly recalculate so we can always see if our expansion vessel is of adequate size. We can then actually build this in to our template so every time we create LTHW or chill water systems or any other pipework systems, we can calculate the expansion vessel volume on the fly. Okay, let's move on to some electrical automations. And here we're going to look at some lux levels to planes some circuiting, some luminaire maintenance factor and photovoltaic array calculations. Okay, so let's start off with lux levels at a plane. Here I'm going to be using a slightly different building because, hey, why not? I can, so I, would, I have. And I need to, again, put in some parameters and use parameters that are built in already. So the parameter I've added here is lux level required. And we can bring this in from rules of thumb or we can have uh, some office standards or we could have it from an employer's information requirement. And we've got a specified lighting local area and our plenum lighting contribution. I'm going to create another colour scheme based on the lux levels and we can see here I've gone from the darker colours, the lower lux level, to the brighter colours, the higher lux levels. Here I've used colours that look harmonious together. You may wish to use contrasting colours if you want to make your deliverables stand out a little bit more. It's entirely up to you what you choose to do. Applying that colour scheme to our layout, we can see now that the lux values for the space type are now colouring our scheme. And this is probably perfectly good for a concept level deliverable. We could also bring in an awful lot of data just from a straight Excel sheet. If we had a room data sheet for each room type that we are likely to uh, create during the course of this project, we can bring in a whole bunch of parameters all in one go. And we could do that using Dynamo. So we could do some very simple calculations within the Dynamo um, interface that brings the values from an Excel spreadsheet directly into our space type objects and we can do that all in one go and calculate an awful lot of different th things that we need to do for our early design stages. We can then again create a space schedule as we can see here we have brought in our required lux levels we have specified lighting load per area as a watts per meter squared value. And this is multiplied by the area of that space to give us an in early indication of what the lighting load is going to be. And again, we can calculate the totals and look at what that value may be. We'll notice also that the actual lighting load and average estimated illumination are at zero because we haven't put any luminaires in the space yet. So let's do that. Let's put some luminaires into a space. Here's one of the spaces that we looked at earlier, and I've just dotted in some luminaires for demonstration purposes. Now we can see that we have some values within the actual lighting load and the average estimated illumination. As we can see here, it's come very close to the 500 lux that we required. The estimated lighting load it calculated here is probably a bit rough and ready. It's not going to be as accurate as if you do it in Dilux or Relux, for example. But it does give us a kind of running commentary on how close we are to what, we are, what our desired goal will be. And for a simple object like this um, meeting room, this is actually fairly good. It's fairly accurate. More complex spaces and more complex lighting schemes we'll probably need to refer to more specialist software to calculate the true values. Okay, so how are we going to circuit up this lighting array that we've created? And how are we going to do that in a smarter way than just drawing lines between our light fittings? 
Well, here, what I've done is I've created some circuits. So we've moved from the outside to the inside of the space and the circuits have been automatically applied by the software. Now, we're using a three phase distribution board here. And as a bit of a traditionalist, I like to use my old phase colors of red, yellow and blue, which are now obviously known as L1, L2 and L3. But this also gives us a very, very quick identification as to which phase each of those lighting circuits is on. And what I've done here is I've actually used a color filter to measure the phase of each circuit. And as we can see, we're using three different phases in a space, which isn't necessarily a great idea because you can actually get a three phase shock if you touch two of those live cables. And we don't want to do that because that is actually hazardous to life. Also, with using automatic annotation. So here, I'm actually automating the tagging of each circuit. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail now. We can also create a panel schedule. And this is just another view of the same data. This is another view of that circuit layout we just saw in the previous slide. And we can see here that the lighting load is spread across the three phases. So what we can now do is we can manually move those lighting loads so they're all on the same phase. We can then lock them to those circuit ways. And when we go back to our drawing, we can see that these are now all colored red and that's an automatic response to us moving them across the phase. We can also see that the circuits have also changed from L1, 2 and L3 to all being L1 in different ways off the board. So, all of that rejigging that we would normally associate with changing the text associated with circuits has all been automated for us. And also we have now the graphical assurance that these are all on the same phase. But what if we want to change the name of the lighting board, which will change the circuit name for all of the circuits that are connected to this. So here we're changing it from lights to the more traditional LTG for a lighting board. If I change it on my panel schedule, it is then reflected immediately on the plan. And this can save hours and hours and hours of technician time. Okay, let's quick look quickly at the maintenance factor for luminaires. Here, I'm just going to use a simple uh, Excel sheet, which I believe is now available uh, from the Society of Light and Lighting by the SIDSI website. It should be free to download. So first things first, luminaire maintenance factor, it's not 0.8. I know that's the number most people put in as a rule of thumb, but there are actual ways of calculating this and 0.8 isn't always the right answer. So let's have a quick look at how we calculate the luminaire maintenance factor. So the overall maintenance factor of a luminaire is a multiplication of the lamp lumen maintenance factor, the lamp survival factor, the luminaire maintenance factor, and the room surface maintenance factor. We multiply all of those together to give us that overall maintenance factor. So where do we get these values from? Well, the International Commission on Illumination have handily provided a series of tables that we can look these values up from. But if we consider we're going to have to do this for each individual lighting type in each different space type, that's quite a task. So can, how much of this can we automate? Well, I've put all of those tables into a simple spreadsheet and the International Commission on Illumination have allowed us to distribute this freely, which is very nice of them, thank you very much. And we have had this checked by the Society of Light and Lighting and so we know it works. What does it look like? It's very simply like this. So all of the beige cells that you can see here and here and here are for input. These ones in this little table are just drop down cells with predefined values. And all you need to do is select the correct ones for your particular situation. The lamp survival factor and the lamp lumen maintenance factor will be available from your chosen manufacturer. So you can ask them what these are and plug them in to your table. Here we can see the overall maintenance factor has been calculated as 0.72. But this is based on a clean, space. What if the space isn't a clean space? We want to change it to a more dirty space. All we need to do is drop down the menu, change it to that, and the maintenance factor is automatically updated. And we can then bring this value through into our Revit model, if that's what we choose to do, 
and use this to have a look at how the lumens from the lamp are going to degrade over time. So we can have an understanding that after a couple of years, that is the proportion of light we're going to get from this luminaire into this space. Okay, let's have a quick look at the vo photovoltaic array calculations. So there's a very simple formula. Unsurprisingly, a lot of this stuff is very simple. The energy is multiplication of the total solar panel area multiplied by the solar panel yield, multiplied by the annual average irradiation on tilted panels, and the performance ratio for coefficient for losses. And we're using here a typical value of 0.75. So how do we solve this? Well, what we can do is we can create a space, or you could have a room, or you could have an area schedule. The choice is yours, it works for all of them. We need to create a schedule of that within Revit. We can apply a filter, so it's only using spaces that are called PV panel array. And then we need the parameters. So the solar panel yield, there you are, the annual average of radiation on tilted, tilted panels, H, so there's a typo in there, and the performance ratio. It should be noted that this does not uh, deal with access between panels. We can put a factor in for that if that's what we want to do. Now we can look at a short video. Hopefully this will play. That demonstrates this actually being done and the values changing within a Revit environment. See there we're expanding our PV array area and the energy that can be harvested from that area increases as we increase the area. Again, a very, very simple automation and one that hopefully will save you plenty of time. Okay, finally, let's look at some public health automations. And here I want to look at rainwater drainage and manhole schedules, just a couple of the potential automations that we can do in the public health arena. There are many, many others. So, rainwater drainage. Initially, we need to understand what the rainfall intensity is going to be. And we can get this information from a number of different sources. For example, you can use a package like micro drainage, or you can look it up on weather maps, or we can use weather data. The source of it is a matter entirely for you. All we need to do is find a value. Again, we're going to use the building that we created for the earlier mechanical uh, presentation on these uh, automations. Traditionally, the rainfall intensity is given in millimeters per hour. And what we actually want to do the calculation is liters per second per meter squared. And to get one to the other, all we need to do is divide the millimetres per hour by 3,600, which gives us our litres per second per metre squared. And we can then input that as part of the project information. We can then create a very, very simple schedule where what we're measuring is the roof area, which is available through the architectural model, the rainfall intensity, which is our parameter, and that multiplied by our other factors, can give us our rainwater outflow. So how do we do this? Simply, we use the calculation for rainwater runoff, which is Q equals R times A times CO, where Q is our flow rate, R is our rainfall intensity, A is the effective roof area, which is measured directly out of the model, and CO is a runoff coefficient. Usually it's just one, so we don't need to worry about it in most applications but some local regulations and practices do state otherwise. So do make sure that you're, if you need to use a runoff coefficient to include that as part of your calculation. So in this particular instance, we're saying we have a runoff, uh, a weather data flow rate of, or rainfall intensity, my apologies, of 0.33 liters per second per meter squared. The area is calculated by Revit, in this particular instance, 371 meters squared, and our coefficient is one. So this can give us that sum you can see before you. If we want to multiply that by, or divide that, sorry, by the number of rainwater downpipes, we can do that as well. And this shows, this is giving us th just over three liters per second per downpipe, if we have four downpipes in our design. To do this, what we need to do is to include the parameters as we have with all the previous ones. So we can apply the rainfall intensity to roofs, which allows us to use it in a roof schedule. And here we see we've added the parameters that we need into our schedule. 
and we create a very, very simple uh, calculation, just multiplying the area by the rainfall intensity. Notice that sometimes I will divide by one or divide by one of a particular unit. That's because Revit is very, very particular about the units it uses. If it gives you a unit error, you can divide by one and that strips away the units of that parameter. It means you can multiply and divide and do whatever other uh, mathematical operations you want and Revit will ignore the units. Although you do have to notice at the end that this is not showing the rainfall flow rate as litres per second. What you can do there is you can actually multiply it by one litre per second and then that uh, unit will be restored. Okay, let's look now very quickly at manhole schedules. Uh, a fun topic um, that we have to do on so many of our projects and it can take up a considerable amount of time. So how can we automate the manhole schedules and the general information that is required around them? Well, the first things first is we need to actually model our underground drainage properly. This means showing the depth of manholes. It means uh, applying the underground drainage going into uh, a manhole and out of it again. And also we need to apply appropriate falls to the pipework. This can make modeling of the underground drainage system a little bit more challenging, but a little bit of time invested here will save us a significantly greater proportion of time as the design evolves over time and all of those invert levels and cover, cover levels are changing. So what we can do is we, once we've properly modeled this system, we can use, for example, a spot level tag to demonstrate the cover level. We can have a mark tag to show what manhole this is. And we can also have a spot coordinate to show where it is. And we can include in that the cover level as well, if we so choose. We can also add in the invert levels. And as we move the spot level around, that invert level number will change. So if we just apply the tag, to the part of the underground pipework that we wish to measure the invert of, that will automatically measure that. This does, of course, mean that you need to have set the Z value of your building correctly according to the site data. But that can make our drawings a little cluttered. So what if we, instead of having all of the information on an overall plan, we can just call out each individual manhole and um, here we uh, applied a small detail marker and the link on there will call it through to whichever drawing you choose to put those details onto. And here we can see a very, very simple graphical manhole schedule, which makes it much more easy for a contractor to specify what manhole is required with the number of ways in and out. And we can label onto this our invert levels and so on and so forth. Well. That was a bunch of very quick and simple um, automations. I hope you found some of them useful. The intention of these are that all of them are achievable by people who don't need to know any programming at all. And these uh, can be built into whichever workflow you choose to use and can automate all of these calculations and outputs for you. Now, I hope that was useful and I'd like to now hand over to our chair and see what questions you have and hopefully I can answer them um, thoroughly and as best I can. So uh, Lucy, do you have some questions? Thank you, Carl. Um, yes, just a reminder as well to um, use the question box to submit them, um, but we have had a few come in. Um, I'd like to start with this one. Um, it's much automation in building services seems to be based on using commercial software, making engineers more or less redundant. Should we focus on developing the engineers programming skills to enable building more in-house to tools? That's a really interesting point, actually. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm hoping that we've demonstrated with these simple automations is that a lot of the engineers time is taken up doing repetitive maths and uh, the repetitive maths is probably not the most exciting thing for an engineer to do. It's better, I think, to free up their time using these automations. The artistry of engineering is what engineers are really good at. And I would always encourage an engineer, play to those strengths, look at the artistry of what it is that we're doing. In relation to the programming aspect, <clears throat> I think 
I personally have always struggled with learning programming languages. I'm an engineer first and foremost, and I know a lot of engineers that can do programming, but whether they do as effective a job as an actual programmer would do is probably in question. Um, I would suggest that having enough understanding of programming to ask someone who is very proficient at it to create a, an automation for your organisation would be a better way of going about it. I know certainly the larger organisations have an increasing number of in-house programmers and the ability to communicate with them in languages they understand is very useful. But um, certainly younger engineers coming out of university, they mostly are programmers and coders in their private time anyway. So I think there's going to be a shift coming. I wouldn't recommend engineers of a certain age, such as myself, to rush out and learn C++ or whatever the um, program language du jour is. Um, but having an understanding of what you can ask for of someone who is good at programming would be really useful. Um, but I, 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 I'm hoping that what this does is doesn't make engineers redundant, but it plays to their strengths and also plays to the strengths of what computers and computing can do. Um, and if we work together in harmony, I think we can do more, we can do it better and we can do it more quickly. And hopefully that's what we need to do to increase our productivity and increase our efficiency. I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Carl. Um, we've had another question um, in relation to the updating of circuit colours, references, etc. Is there a way to cloud these changes on all associated drawings and schedules? Um, there's not currently a way of automating the clouding of changes on deliverables. Um, there are some ways around this though. Um, certainly when we exchange drawings, and I'm going to use the specific 2D flat drawings um, deliverable here, what you can do is you can actually compare one revision to a previous revision and that will automatically highlight changes. Um, there are also some quite clever programmatic things that you can do um, that will look at um, which was the most recently edited um, using, um, again, this uses some quite complex algorithms, but you can find which has changed since you last saw that model if you're working in a purely 3D environment. And you can then schedule the things that have been changed and then um, from the schedule go directly to that thing. In terms of generating that cloud graphic, sadly no, that doesn't exist yet. Um, I've, I've got a, actually got a meeting with Autodesk on Friday, maybe I'll suggest it. <laughs> thank you for the question. Great, thank you. Um, next question, if you can source rainfall intensity from a number of different places, will it be consistent data from these different places? Uh, again, probably not. Um, there's, there are, um, as the question suggests, different sources of data. Um, certainly the city weather data all comes from single source, um, which is as it should be, um, which is the Met Office. We uh, take uh, an enormous quantity of raw data from the Met Office, spend an awful lot of time and effort post-processing it to give uh, you guys something useful. Uh, but that is mainly for UK locations. Um, obviously, we live in a global village now um, and we work all over the planet. So uh, the source that you use for your rainfall data has to be an appropriate source for what you're doing, where you're doing it um, and what local uh, regulations are asking for. Uh, so um, it's probably not something that is necessarily within the purview of the engineer to just choose. You need to be able to stand up your assumptions and say that you're conforming to whichever uh, norms are required in the jurisdiction in which you're designing. Uh, I know I, I, I did show some um, simple examples that are probably UK applicable. They would probably have come from the same source. Great, thank you. Um, also, someone's asked where they can get their hands on the lighting maintenance factor Excel table. 
that you well, spoke about. Interesting. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I did a, a little webinar for the Society of Light and Lighting um, just last week, actually, and the same question came up, and we were absolutely convinced it was on the Sydney website, and then we couldn't find it. <laughs> so we think we did a bit of a boo-boo there, um, and uh, I have sent a, a, another copy to the SLL, and uh, they either have or are about to post it on the Sydney website. Um, if anyone wants it, um, please do let us know, um, and I'll make sure that you get a copy. Uh, it is completely free to use, um, and you can distribute it to your uh, friends and colleagues as you see fit as well. Great, thank you, Carl. Yeah, we'll make sure that that is included in the follow-up email. Um, we've got another question. Have any plugins or add-ins been used on top of the standard Revit program? Um, no. Uh, the only extra piece of technology used uh, within Revit there was Dynamo, which comes pre-installed, but not everyone is necessarily comfortable using Dynamo because it's a very uh, different environment. Um, the power of that, I would like to say, is that it does programming without you needing to understand programming. So going back to the question earlier, if there are engineers who wish to get into a programming environment, Dynamo is a kind of easy way in. Um, I didn't use anything other than what comes out of the box. I've, you might have used it in some slightly unusual ways. Um, but that comes from having used this package for 20 odd years and I'm sure everyone who uses any piece of software knows the shortcuts, tricks and hacks that make the thing do what you want it to do. So um, um, part of this was to actually demonstrate this is what you can do out of the box. There, there was no uh, bought in extra functionality. Thank you. Um, I think this one's a good one for you, Carl, as I know it's something you've been working on. Um, have SIBSI considered providing the tabulated data from guides in a digital format, which can be easily referenced by the BIM software? Well, there's a long answer and a short answer to this, and they're both yes. <laughs> um, we are working on this, and we are working very hard on this. Um, this is part of our next generation of SIBSI knowledge. Uh, we've done something um, with the energy benchmarking. Um, I'm sure a number of you are aware that well, we had a guide that covered energy benchmarking. And we also had a, a TM that covered benchmarking. We've now translated that and actually even updated the process to being a live and dynamic one on the SIBTI website. And you can see that if you just go to the uh, benchmarking on SIBTI.org. On top of that, we're also building API or application programming interfaces into this interface. So you don't actually need to physically go and look at the dynamic energy benchmarking. You can tell your computer program, whichever platform you're using, go and find values based on these parameters. And we're working on doing that for as much city knowledge as we possibly can. We're starting with the big ticket items, the stuff we all use day in, day out. So things like ductwork and pipework. Um, all of that data, we're also looking at doing this with weather data um, because that's the stuff we all use as engineers all of the time. And it's a pain in the backside, frankly, to constantly be flicking through PDFs. And again, I'm of an age when we used to flick through cotton bound um, hard copies of the guides to find particular values. Again, let's play to the computer's strengths and say, OK, computer, this is what I want you to find, and these are the parameters I'm giving you. The computer goes off, finds those values, and returns them to you in less time than it would take you to find the PDF of the guide. So absolutely, yes, we are doing that. Um, yes, it is going to take some time because we need to make sure that what we're doing is absolutely robust. And we also need to make sure that city members continue to get this as a member benefit but also we're not just going to open this up to anyone. You know, we, we appreciate our city members. We appreciate what they do with us. So we're going to maintain this freedom to knowledge, but we also need to make sure that the services we provide to non-members is chargeable. So that supports, again, the free knowledge to our members. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, I've had another question um, regarding um, rainwater. So, 
Um, siphonic rainwater drainage works with different pipe sizings from gravity, gravity flow systems. How can this be incorporated into what you've just shared? Um, what I didn't do during that uh, rainwater um, demonstration was do any um, pipe sizing. And, and as uh, the questioner rightly asks, um, siphonic drainage pipe sizing is quite different to uh, gravity flow uh, pipe sizing. Um, what this is doing is feeding the raw information into um, the calculation. So we know the quantity of water that could be entering the system. Now, obviously, with um, I'm assuming we're talking about siphonic drainage where the rainwater is ponding above the rainwater outlet. So um, we will need to keep that ponding at a specific level and that specific level will be a function of the quantity of rain at peak storm times uh, landing on that roof. So I think the calculation is probably still valid, um, but um, the, the actual sizing of downpipes um, is, is a subtly different thing between um, siphonic and gravity. Um, it, it's not my specialist area, so sorry if I'm a little vague on that. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, not a public health engineer, and I'm glad no one's asked me an electrical one yet. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, this this question came quite early in your presentation. Um, can daily or weekly profiles be added to various load types? Um, that is possible, actually. Yes, um, it's something I was funny enough. I was actually playing around with that this, this very morning. Um, you can um, add in uh, a series of parameters or actually a single parameter, but it, what it does is it has um, a usage schedule. And this is particularly true um, of uh, lighting and small power um, loads. You can do this over time. It's one of the things that, if we're honest, the, the platform we were demonstrating, the, the Revit platform, is not particularly good at demonstrating stuff over time, uh, but it's not impossible. I have seen it done. It's just a little bit more work. Um, I would suggest there are probably slightly better solutions for that more detailed calculation where we're looking at total coincident load over time. Uh, the, I would imagine that you know, things like IES and TAS as, as two quick examples would be able to do uh, a much better job of that without um, the, all the grief of programming that into uh, some schedules. So yes, it can be done, um, but there are probably better solutions out there at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, another question's come in regarding software packages. So someone said, uh, has asked, can this be linked to other software packages? Um, and they've given the example such as Amtech Pro Design. Yes, it absolutely can. Um, in fact, um, for <laughs> for reasons of time, I actually cut out a bit where I, I would uh, show that. Um, the example I was I didn't have time to show um, was um, the one of the buildings exporting to Relux to do a, a lighting calculation was a particular example I was going to use, but it's it's equally true for any other external platform. Um, there are ways and means of achieving this, and you need to find the one that suits your particular workflow. There isn't one off-the-shelf solution that fits everything in every circumstance, which is a shame, but the way of the world at the moment. What I found was there are essentially seven different file formats that you can export from Revit and import that geometry and some of the engineering information into external analytical packages. And this is not using any plugins or anything like that. This is simple DWG, DXF, FBX, uh, GBXML, etc. cetera. Um, that's the, the, the roughest technique. And what I've found is that um, the best amount of data you can get across, the best proportion, I should say, of data you can get across is about 80%, which is not great, it's not perfect, but it's 80% of the work you're not going to have to do in that package to model up a replica of the building. Um, so it significantly reduces that when used in its rawest form. A significant number of these um, more specialist analytical packages are now coming with uh, platform plugins, and Revit is a particularly good example of this, 
where there are um, a number of plugins for uh, Amtech, uh, for Relux, for Dialux, that will take data from the Revit platform, it will operate on it, and it will return it. Um, only sort of five or six years ago, these plugins were, again, if I'm brutally honest, not particularly good, but they have come on in leaps and bounds recently and are now returning really, really good, well-calculated data, stuff that we trust, um, back into the Revit platform. And this will only increase over time. For those that don't have uh, a bespoke plugin available, again, we can use um, the Dynamo interface to go between uh, a third-party software and the Revit interface. Um, this would require some more specialist programming to get into the API of the third party application. Um, but again, if it saves you an hour a project, you do 100 projects a year and it's 20 hours of programming time, that's going to save you 80 hours a year, every year. And that is a, a part of why you know we should be thinking about these automations because they do significantly improve the productivity that we uh, can achieve great thank you um hopefully a quick answer to this one is dynamo free to use yes it most certainly is um it comes uh, free with revit obviously you need to um purchase or subscribe to revit to get the revit instantiation of dynamo However, it is available as an open sourced standalone software. So you can use Dynamo um, on its own, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of the connections into the Revit interface if you use it standalone. But yes, it, if, if you have a, a copy of Revit, it is completely free to use. Great, thank you. Um, how are equipment volumes included in system expansion calculations? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I would add that in as either a, a factor or you can add that in uh, if you have the um, numbers for um, the system volume, then um, that should actually be included within the uh, pipework system. So, for example, if we have an LTHW system, that is feeding a radiator circuit, the radiator should have a parameter that says I contain this quantity of water, and that should be the same um, parameter that feeds into the uh, volume within the pipework. Again, it's, it's not a, a straightforward thing to do, um, but it, it certainly can be done. Um, the one I demonstrated there was purely on the pipework, and I completely understand um, why the question is asked. Um, yes, yes, you can do it, um, but you need to be very, very careful when creating your equipment families that this has the correct parameter, not just a suitable, but the correct parameter inside it to um, allow this additive volume. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, one in regards to um, SIBC offerings, um, is there a SIBC recommended shared parameter naming convention? That exists. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that. This is something that uh, the SIBSI Digital Engineering Steering Group has been mulling over for more than a year now, in fact. Um, there are standards, uh, actual uh, British and international standards out there that say this is how you should name your parameters. Um, again, don't tell anyone, but they don't actually work that well. Um, the ones I demonstrated uh, were actually the ones I used to use when I was a BIM manager at Arup. And um, we actually thought this through. Um, we actually had a, a, a week long meeting of all of the BIM managers and we worked out this is the most logical way we can think of. It doesn't actually conform to any standard. Um, Again, it's something I would suggest in the first instance, each organisation should sit down and think about what works for them, um, because certainly the way um, I worked at Arup was not the same as um, colleagues that I now work with from various other um, large consultancies. Each consultancy has its own very unique way of 
uh, doing things of looking at engineering problems and that's good you know we all we don't want to all be identical um, but you need to find something that works for you um, an extension of that is that you also need to find something that works for the people with whom you work and I mean by that um, this would be your design team colleagues the architects and structural engineers um, and also downstream the contractors and the manufacturers and the commissioning engineers they all need to be able to look at that parameter name and go ah oh, yeah I know what that means I know what that does and I think that's the most important thing to think about rather than coming up with a particularly clever schema is saying is looking at a parameter name and saying I know what that does intuitively and instinctively. Thank you Carl and um, this one's about the kind of um, setup of Revit within a company um, so that someone said that there needs to be appreciation from senior management and for anyone um, to be on board early on how should come how do you think companies should evolve to adopt these tools um, okay the, without reciting my entire working life this is what I've been doing my entire working life and I can almost hear the pain in the question uh, I know I've been there and it's not really understood that um, you don't just open the box and the software magically works which is quite often the perception with uh, some senior people and also some not so senior people we need to tailor and tame the software to do what we want it to do the way i have generally gone about uh, engaging with senior management and senior engineers is to say okay out of the box it does this and actually show that the out of the box it's quite simple but it has a lot of potential and your job as a senior technician or a BIM manager or a CAD manager or whatever your job title is, is to unleash the potential that it presented to you. And what you could do, as an example, is you could take some of these little automations and productivity gains and say, look, if we do this in our template, it's gonna take me two hours, three hours, 10 hours, whatever it happens to be. It's going to save us that on every project. Multiply that by every project we do, and that is money in your back pocket. That is time out of your schedule. So if you give me this amount of time to put this into shape, to unleash the potential that is presented to us, this will save you time, this will save you money, this will give you a better product, this will give you a better looking product, and it will give it to you more quickly and more accurately. And that is the conversation I, I have to have with people. Um, if we have the technician conversation with an engineer or a manager or a director, they really don't get it. They won't understand why would they? It's your job, not their job. What we need to do is to talk to people in the language that uh, echoes for their particular work. So if you're, um, if you're managing a project, you're a senior engineer, what they want to know is, Am I getting a good result? Am I getting it quickly? If I change my mind, how's that going to affect my timetable? And all three of those answers you can um, give them uh, in terms I will understand. Directors are looking at overall project schedules, they're looking at efficiency, they're looking at productivity, and they're looking at profitability. And again, you can demonstrate that with some fairly simple calculations to say, this is how long this is going to take, this is how much it will save you per project, you do the maths. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, we have time for one more question and we have a great one, I think, to finish. Um, so Carl, how do you see the role of the engineers change as the technology evolves? That is a very good one to end on, actually, yes. Um, I see, see, it's strange, actually. It, I think it actually, almost comes full circle. When I started in building services engineering in 18 billion or um, when the world was in black and white, the people who did the drawings were generally young engineers who were going to college and you would progress from the boards as they called it to doing calculations and you did this stage by stage and then when CAD came along it became two different disciplines, engineering 
and producing the deliverables. And I think actually what's happening is we're getting back to the progression strategy of younger people do the bulk of the modeling, but you do the bulk of the modeling with an engineering view. So you're doing some of the simple engineering tasks and the more senior engineer is guiding you in those tasks, which then frees up the more senior engineer to make the bigger decisions, do the more complicated calculations, uh, to you know, do the meetings that need to be done, to do the coordination meetings, to talk to clients, to do site visits, to do um, testing and things like that. So I think it's actually bringing the engineer back to what they used to do, which was to take the bigger decisions, to get on with the artistry of engineering, which only comes through experience, and then to give the smaller and simpler tasks to the more junior engineers who are essentially merging with technicians. I think that the, the word technician has been misused over the years. A technician is not a draftsman or draftsperson, sorry. They are people who are creating deliverables by applying engineering principles. A drafter is someone who copies something that's been engineered by someone else. So I, I can't see there being any more drafters. I can see there will be technicians and those technicians will be more junior engineers and a technician will then move forward into an intermediate engineer who will be doing less modeling and more of the artistry of engineering through to a senior engineer who will be running the project. And then we can have um, the progression strategy that we used to have um, back when we um, didn't have computers, which I think actually is a good thing. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. Thank you, Carl. Um, that's all we have time for today. Um, big thank you to Carl um, for that very insightful and informative presentation. Um, we hope you found it informative. And um, just a reminder that the presentation is being recorded and will be available from tomorrow. You will receive an email with a link to get that recording and also the presentation slides. Um, we hope um, that you will join us again for another Grow Your Knowledge um, webinar. Um, you will find information on the series at city.org forward slash grow your knowledge. Thank you again for joining. Goodbye.